Welcome to the Wiedenbaum Center Breakfast Talk Series, uh, which is uh, interesting. Here we have it at uh, our, our normal eight o'clock time, and I've had my two cups of coffee, so uh, hopefully we're ready to go. Uh, it's uh, great to see everyone, uh, at least uh, virtually. Uh, our numbers are going up very quickly. We already have 52 people uh, participating. And uh, I'm looking forward to having a, a very interesting event. Let me just start off again by thanking all of our supporters. Uh, this is a interesting, challenging, in some sense, difficult time uh, at the university. And the Wiedenbaum Center is, you know, we are in a leadership transition as, as uh, I've filled the big shoes of Steve Smith, who had been leading the center for over 19 years. Uh, so we have, uh, we have our challenges, but everybody's been very supportive and encouraging. So I'm, um, very appreciative and I want to thank everyone for your uh, you know your kind words and pats on the back as, as we go forward and so we have a active set of uh, events planned for the fall uh, in uh, including uh, today's talk so uh, I guess uh, the speaker today really doesn't need an introduction and, and really won't get one yeah, since it is me uh, so I'm going to just launch in to start talking about a topic that's uh, I know of interest to a lot of us these days. So I'll be sharing my screen and my slides. And there we are. So uh, today I wanna discuss with you thinking hard about government debt. Uh, I have been thinking hard about government debt for the vast majority of my 38 years at Washington University. I've been as a topic that's been central to my teaching and has moved into my research over the years. And I am uh, really interested in, in sharing some thoughts with you about, uh, about this issue that is taking on a lot of prominence, of course, in the um, discussions these days. So uh, let me just uh, you know, dive right in. Uh, government debt discussion is everywhere, uh, maybe most obviously because of the big spending that we have to uh, combat the COVID-19 recession. Uh, there is about $3 trillion of additional government spending or uh, various kinds of tax relief and other things that have been passed by Congress and, and signed by the president uh, since the uh, beginning of the crisis. Uh, in, uh, I believe it was late April, the CARES Act was passed, which is the biggest part of this, that provided enhanced unemployment and the uh, Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses and various support for larger businesses like airlines. And so it, just a huge amount, unprecedented amount of additional government spending. And uh, issue naturally comes up, well, what's that going to do to government debt and what will be the consequences of this? As a result, uh, this key measure of the amount of government debt uh, that, that we have, the ratio of the total government debt held by the public to the size of the economy, to GDP, is now forecast to exceed the previous record. Uh, it's, it's almost there now and will probably exceed it next year. That record was set in World War II, I'll show you a chart in a second, uh, when obviously uh, the, uh, the country was completely uh, engulfed in, uh, in production for the war. Uh, so this is a, a quite of a, a significant event. Magnifying all this is of course the fact that we have an election coming up. And so there are election year politics tied up with, uh, with the government debt question. And I, I wanna emphasize that this is really a bipartisan issue in some sense. The criticism of government debt, the controversy of, of, around government debt is, is really quite bipartisan. When I arrived at Washington University in 1982, uh, the, it was very early in the first term of the Reagan administration and uh, uh, Ronald Reagan was pu pushing for big tax cuts and also expansion of military spending and some other things. So you had increased spending and lower taxes and uh, as we'll see, a, a big rise in government debt, and the Democrats were, were heavily uh, critical of this. Uh, and then later on, uh, I would think, jump all the way to the Obama administration when uh, the Great Recession hit, the financial crisis, and uh, Obama, President Obama was trying to get the uh, uh, stimulus bill. It was the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act officially, but it's usually known as Obama Stimulus. Uh, and uh, the Republicans were very critical of that, especially uh, as the Obama, the first Obama term played out uh, with um, uh, you know, lots of controversy and a, and a big kerfuffle I'll talk about later 
over uh, over government debt and the debt limit. And so you know, flip that way, and then we had President Trump and the big tax cut early in in his uh, term. That uh, that again, the Democrats were criticizing because of look at what it's doing to the deficit, and, and we don't need this at this time. So this kind of flips back and forth depending upon who's uh, who's in power. And in some sense, my message today is that that most of this discussion, you know, misses a lot of important factors, whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans, you know, taking the lead of the criticism. Uh, so here's just a, I'm gonna do a couple of early charts and we'll come back to do some, uh, a little bit more data later. So this is uh, the, uh, the ratio of the US federal surplus or deficit. It's hardly ever a surplus. You can see I have the, this little red dotted line here that's coming through at zero. And so as long as this number is below zero, which it almost always is, the US federal government's running a deficit. You see these numbers go all the way back to the Great Depression. Uh, World War II was quite striking. We had a deficit that exceeded 25% of GDP in the, in the, towards the end of the war, uh, just you know, totally unprecedented uh, then and, and even into now. Uh, then, then we kind of jumped up more or less to balanced budget, but by the, even by the early 1960s in the Vietnam era, we were starting to be mostly negative, and then there's just been a, a you know, relatively what looks, looks like a, a now a mild downward trend, but, uh, but you do see this, this pickup in the deficit around that, you know, that Reagan period I was talking about uh, uh, that, that comes up there. Then uh, there was this little moment here in the end of the Clinton administration when the uh, budget went uh, for just a couple of years into surplus, and then since then we've hit deficits. And I, I've emphasized the recessions all the way through here. So uh, this is the 1974-75 uh, recession. This is the one uh, that was early in the Reagan administration, 80 to 82 approximately, the early 90s, the bursting of the tech bubble, the great recession, and then finally the COVID recession. And, and what you see here is that uh, of course, or maybe not of course, but this, this really makes it clear that, uh, that this is the, I believe this is the projected number for 2020, but I know it is the one that's up there. It's not, uh, we don't know exactly where it's gonna be uh, yet, but uh, with great certainty, it will be by far the biggest government deficit relative to the size of the economy since World War II. So we're, you know, kind of every one of these crises that's hitting since um, the bursting of the tech bubble, we're hitting uh, bigger and bigger deficits uh, as, as we go forward. Uh, this next chart is the uh, kind of complement to the deficit, which shows the amount of debt held uh, by the public, that's say outside of the government, outside of the Federal Reserve. And this is again, as a percent of GDP, it's important to, uh, to scale these things to the size of the economy to have a, a reasonable historical comparison. And uh, so this is, the deficit is how much the government's borrowing every year, and then that leads to an accumulation of debt, and that's what you're looking at right here. So uh, of course, we had a, a massive increase in the US federal debt in the World War II era, uh, peaking at, uh, well, it looks here, about 115% of GDP. And then a very long period, a multi-decade period of that going almost you know, down uh, quite, quite steadily to the point where we were just over 20% uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio by the 1970s. But you see here, again, that kind of shift of policy in the early Reagan administration when the debt starts rising again. We do have this retrenchment, uh, which is the combination of some economic policies in the Clinton administration and a very strong economic boom, which tends to raise taxes and reduce spending on things like unemployment benefits. And we saw the debt ratio drop down uh, to in the, the middle 30s. Then the Great Recession, it picks up again uh, quite significantly, really doubles during that period. And once again, you see the projections here uh, with the COVID recession, and now you can see how it's approaching the World War II levels uh, as we as we move into the next year. So uh, there's this kind of sense of well, this is out of control, it's unsustainable, all these things that are, that are that are that are happening. So why why might we worry about the big rise in uh, federal government debt? Well, the basic idea, or I think the way most people approach this, is to draw a parallel between uh, what the government's doing and what they would be doing in their own lives or in their own businesses. Uh, one is the idea, well, for borrowing today, we, of course, we have to repay it in the future. If you have to repay in the future, that's going to lower standards of living in some sense. So 
the most common soundbite criticism you hear about government debt is we're mortgaging the future of our children and our grandchildren. Somehow they, we're borrowing today, they're going to have to repay this through their taxes in the future. And that this is immoral in a sense, it's unjustified that, that we're, uh, it, it's, it's just wrong. Um, as uh, at least one critic has said, it, it, uh, it becomes kind of a, a morality play about the, um, uh, the way in which we are burdening future generations with our current fiscal policy. Uh, another uh, concern is that the US government will default, that, um, that uh, or at least has the risk of default. And, and if, if the government's unable to pay its debt back, or there's a concern it will be unable to pay its debt back, that lenders, the people that provide the funds to the government, will no longer be willing to, to, uh, to, uh, to lend to the US federal government. The, the uh, debt rating would, would go down and the interest rate would go up and you see crises like Greece and Italy uh, as uh, examples say maybe we're on a path to this kind of concern about default risk. Uh, another related issue is the idea of the interest uh, cost. So the bigger the debt, the greater the interest, at least holding interest rates constant. Uh, the debt doesn't come for free. And, uh, and so it's again, this idea of burdening the future, not just with repaying the debt, but also servicing that debt by paying interest. And then finally, and these things are all related, this idea that somehow the debt path is unsustainable, it's exploding. So going back to this chart, you know, you see this hockey stick like uh, movement and said, no, we, we can't keep doing this. We have to stop this. This is, this is ultimately going to be unsustainable and with, with negative consequences that are often unspecified, but just saying this can't continue. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I do wanna make an important point that will be a theme for the whole talk today. And that is the distinction between private versus public debt. All of the things I said on the previous slide are relevant for private debt and are to some extent correct. All of those things can happen. If you borrow when you're young uh, excessively, when you're older, your standard of living is gonna be lower because you have to pay back your debt. Uh, if you uh, borrow too much and are in risk of default, you're gonna be cut off by your lenders. If you can get debt, it's gonna be at a higher interest rate. Uh, all, all, these things, all these things are true for private debt. But these sometimes called common sense concerns don't necessarily extend to the government. There are some basic differences between private and public debt that I wanna emphasize. Also, there's a difference in thinking about a particular household or a particular business as an individual versus the system as a whole versus the entire economy and what's going on. And you'll see in some of the discussions to come how thinking about this from a, the perspective of the economy as a whole changes uh, the way we might see uh, the effects of debt. So uh, I think what I'll have to say of today is a little provocative. What you're gonna hear from me is that a lot of these concerns that are perfectly sensible and, and follow from common sense for private debt do not carry over to the government. And as such, I think we sometimes uh, uh, catastrophize too much the uh, idea of uh, government debt as being unsustainable and out of control. But there are limits and I, and I will certainly emphasize those as we go through. Uh, another factor that, uh, uh, well, maybe I'll wait just for a second before going to the next, next slide is that many of you have been part of the Wiedenbaum Center discussions uh, you know, for years, you've heard me comment often very briefly on these issues of fiscal policy. And, and I might say something like the fact, well, I'm a deficit dove compared to a deficit hawk or a debt dove compared to a debt hawk. And uh, often this would go by in a, in a minute or two. And, and a big reason I wanted to give this talk was to give you some background on, on that issue and explain, you know, where that comes from. And, and so there are, there are controversies, there are differences here, uh, but I want you to understand at least where my perspective is coming, but I'll also point out where in some ways my views differ from, from those of others. Okay, so what are the objectives specifically for the talk? One is, I'm gonna, I've organized this as, in terms of six big questions. I could have, I could have had at least 12. Uh, there are plenty of, plenty of important topics here, but uh, we'll focus on, on the first six and maybe there'll be some talk down the road or uh, in our question and answer where we can get at some of the other issues. Uh, I, I wanna explain carefully why government and private borrowing are fundamentally different. And then I wanna link, link this to evidence. As I say, there's, you know, there, there's controversy here. There are differences of, of views. Uh, interestingly, the mainstream of the economics world is, is coming around more to, to the view I've held for a long time, uh, but th there's still debates about these things. And so we wanna use the evidence to try to sort out 
which of the arguments seem to be to fit the reality most. And, and then we'll finish up with some broad lessons for policy. And my plan is uh, very much <coughs> to leave some time for questions and discussion as we go on. Uh, in fact, I'm going to make sure I have the chat window open uh, where you can uh, type in a question as, as, as we go along, if you wish, and, and then we'll have a more structured time for discussion at the end. Okay, so uh, big question number one. Doesn't the debt have to be paid back? This idea that we're burdening the future uh, generations by, by forcing them to pay back the debt. Uh, so of course, personal debt has to be paid back. Again, this is the common sense. I mean, sadly, people die. You can't leave debt to your heirs. Uh, I was looking up the law last night, actually, that if you die with, uh, with debt, the executor of your, or the executive who takes care of your estate uh, needs to do what they can to, to resolve, the, um, uh, resolve the debt within the estate, but uh, the heirs are not directly responsible for the debt if there's not enough resources when someone passes away uh, to cover their debts. So uh, what, what does that mean? Well, that means that uh, a lender is gonna make sure you can pay your debt back uh, and, and pay your debt back during your lifetime. Uh, more practically, not so sadly, is that people retire. Uh, and if you're gonna retire, you're doing something that really in the, the kind of the human history is unusual. You're trying to consume while you're not working or producing. And that's really in some ways what retirement means. And, and uh, if you have debts as you retire that you have to pay back uh, and service, then, then it's gonna be more difficult for you to be able to maintain your lifestyle when you are no longer getting the paycheck from your job. So uh, in this sense, you want to pay your debt back uh, before you retire so that you're able to, uh, uh, able to have a comfortable uh, period after your work. So the, the bottom line is personal debt has to be paid back and this generates the common sense and, and people think, well, uh, the government uh, uh, must be in the same situation. Okay, well, but think about this for a second. The, as my previous slide emphasized, the reason that we think of personal debt necessarily as having to be paid back is because we don't live forever. But in some sense, the government does live forever. Well, maybe by historical standards, you know, the Roman Empire was hundreds of years, but eventually, eventually went away. So maybe we don't necessarily live forever, but it, there's a sense in which the government continues on indefinitely. It hasn't, doesn't have what economists might call a terminal date. And in this sense, the debt really never does need to be paid back. That as long as you can refinance your bonds, uh, you roll them over, you just kind of keep going. Uh, and I, I put on the slide here the, the analogy to corporate debt. So take a company like General Motors. It's been with us for a, a long time now. And I'm sure that through most of its history, including today, they've always had debt on their balance sheet. Uh, when bonds come due, they, uh, they, they borrow again and issue new bonds and they, and they move forward. And the idea is that General Motors will keep producing cars and keep generating profits so it can keep servicing that debt. And so they don't really ever totally pay it off. An interesting example is uh, a security that was, it was issued by the British government several hundred years ago called a consul. I believe that's a short for something called a consolidated annuity. And these were literally perpetual bonds. Uh, the Brits uh, would borrow some amount of money. They would give the, the lender uh, a security, a bond that basically said, we'll pay you this much interest indefinitely on this bond for as long as you hold it. Uh, and, and so they were literally borrowing, uh, borrowing forever in some sense. There was no terminal date, no date of maturity for the, for the British consuls. And there was a market for these things. They were actually around until the early 20th century. Um, another example, a little bit more practical along these lines would be that, well, let's just look at the recent history that I showed you a few minutes ago. So the US borrowed uh, uh, a huge amount of money uh, in, during World War II and has hardly ever run a surplus since then. Uh, so uh, the idea that it was somehow paying down the debt would mean that you are bringing in more money in tax revenue than you're, than you're spending. You'd have to have a government surplus to pay down that debt literally. And we, we hardly have ever done it you know, for 75 years running. Uh, and, and I wanna argue that there's really no future day of reckoning coming for government debt when somehow it's gonna need to be paid off. Uh, and uh, so the, this is a big distinction between uh, private debt and, and government debt in that sense. I'm trying to deal with the chat window here a little bit. Uh, uh, yes, uh, actually there's an interesting question from Gail, I'll just mention right now. We do need to distinguish between uh, 
federal government debt and the, the debt of states. That's actually a very important issue. And let me be clear about that. Everything I'm saying for right now is about, uh, it, it is about federal debt. Uh, the states are in a very different uh, situation. I'd be happy to talk about that more later. So uh, when I, you know, the title thinking hard about uh, U.S. government debt is what it should say, or U.S. federal debt. Uh, the, the states are very different in that sense. Um, okay. In effect, the way the states are different is really uh, related to big question number two, uh, which is that uh, should, we be, we were, we, should we be worried about default uh, and national bankruptcy? Well, the states actually do have to worry about that, but uh, the federal government does not. Uh, so in the, the jargon that's often used in talking about these issues, the, the United States uh, is a sovereign currency country. That is, we issue our own currency. Uh, you know, Greece is not a sovereign currency country. Greece cannot issue euros. Illinois is not a, a sovereign currency country. Illinois cannot create dollars. But the United States federal uh, government, taken as a whole, incorporating the Federal Reserve, can indeed create their own money. Uh, and as a result, the U.S. government, the federal government, will never be forced to default. Uh, that the debt is in dollars and dollars that the government can create. So it can always pay its debt. There's never any issue of whether the government uh, is able to pay its debt as long as that can, so, so to speak, print, print money. In the modern world, it's more like keystrokes to create money, uh, to uh, create dollars to service or pay off, if they wished, uh, debts that are in dollars. Now, I did mention earlier on what I'm calling this political kerfuffle in 2011. Uh, the U.S. government has, um, has a, a kind of strange policy, which is in addition to its annual budget, which specifies a surplus or a deficit, almost always a deficit, there's in addition to that a limit on the total federal debt. And uh, there's often a you know, bit of political theater around raising this debt ceiling, even though the budget has already been passed, even though the president and Congress are already have in place policies that are going to impose a particular amount of borrowing, uh, they, uh, they have to, in addition, authorize an increase in the debt limit. Well, in 2011, there was controversy between uh, the Republican Congress and the Obama administration coming out of this period of the Great Recession when the federal debt had risen a lot. And uh, there was this threat of, of not raising the debt ceiling, which would have imposed a kind of default by the U.S. government. You say, well, this uh, Pizarro is telling us the U.S. government is never forced to default, but it seemed like they might have. And, and here it was, it was, from my point of view, it wasn't forced. It could have happened. That had they not uh, raised the debt ceiling, then, um, then there, there could have been a kind of default that would have taken place. But this was a self-imposed problem. There was no economic necessity. Uh, you know, for this issue. In fact, I remember a policy lunch discussion at the Wiedenbaum Center when Murray was still with us. And one place where Murray and I entirely agreed was that the whole federal debt ceiling uh, debate and even the presence of this federal debt ceiling as a separate constraint on fiscal policy besides the budget process was really silly. And there was no way that the, the U.S. government should be threatening to fall through this, this kind of political theater. And, and since then, that's, that's kind of died down. In fact, the U.S. government uh, bond rating went down a little bit during that period of time, possibly causing interest rates to be higher, and, and hopefully people learned their lessons. Now, the last point here of the, uh, on this slide, though, is, is inflation, because you say, oh, okay, Fazari's telling us that uh, the, the uh, U.S. government never can, uh, needs to default because it can print money to pay its debt, debts if it needs to. But what about inflation? And that is an important concern, and, and I'll have more to say about that later. So I'm going to hold off on that. But if you're thinking that, that uh, printing money could create inflation, it could. I think in our current environment it will not, but, uh, but we, we will come back and talk more about that as we, as we move forward. Okay, uh, what's big question number three of six? Is the growth of U.S. federal debt somehow explosive or unsustainable? Uh, it looked like it with the charts I showed earlier, uh, especially in the last, from the Great Recession period and now the COVID period, where you've seen this massive increase in uh, the debt to GDP ratio. Is this unsustainable? Well, uh, now I'm going to push you a little bit harder um, with, uh, with one equation, only one equation this morning, uh, but you're going to get one. Uh, so this I'm calling the iron law of government debt in the long run. And again, this is the federal government debt. Uh, 
So I've been emphasizing this debt to GDP ratio, the total amount of debt outstanding divided by our biggest measure of the size of the economy, gross domestic product. Well, without going through uh, you know, some not terribly complicated, but maybe a little bit tedious math, uh, it, it's quite straightforward to show that the debt to GDP ratio, this little d star I've got in my equation, will converge over long periods of time, and sometimes it is quite long, to this, this equation you see here. So in the numerator, you have effectively the government deficit divided by uh, GDP. So it's government spending uh, over GDP minus taxes over GDP. In the denominator, you have the growth rate of the economy uh, less the after-tax interest rate. So just in, a, in rough sense, if you have a bigger deficit, the debt ratio is going to be higher. If you have faster growth rate, the debt ratio is going to be lower. If you have a higher interest rate, the debt ratio is going to be higher. So this is what, you know, this, is what this equation says. So it, it has a certain intuition behind it. Now, I will want to emphasize that the convergence can be quite slow. I'm doing a little bit of research right now where I've done some simulations of this, um, this process in a, with a policy that, that reduces the debt to GDP ratio. And I found that uh, with, uh, I think, fairly realistic uh, parameters of my simulation that it, it, the half-life is uh, something like 40 years. That is, if the debt ratio, say, is going to fall from 100% to 50%, it might take us 40 years to even get to 75%, and then another 40 years to get half the way, halfway further. So it's, uh, it could be a very slow process, but it will eventually you know, converge to this level. However, there is one important condition, which is that this D star needs to be positive. And assuming we have a positive deficit in the numerator, what we need is a positive denominator. I'll take you back to your eighth grade math. And what that tells you is that to have a sustainable debt ratio, the economic growth rate has to be greater than the after-tax interest rate. And what I mean by the after-tax interest rate is the interest rate after you take into account the fact that when people earn interest, they pay some of that income back as taxes. So we're going to look at the difference between the growth rate of the economy and this, an estimate of this after-tax interest rate. So let's take a look and see what it, what it looks like here. Box. So here's uh, my next chart. This goes back to 1960. I've done some smoothing here. This is this this ratio is highly cyclical. Of course, when the economy's in recession, the growth rate drops off a lot, and uh, there are things like that. So I've done a, a quite a smooth period here, a 11 year moving average that uh, that takes out some of those cyclical effects. And and you can see the basic story. It's this this really this uh, kind of Nike swoosh shape <laughs> picture. Whereas this uh, difference between the growth rate and the interest rate was around uh, three percentage points in the 1960s and 1970s, then dropped quite significantly. It was picked back up again, and now it's converging. Those last, those dotted lines there are a forecast going using some of the CBO projections, going I think up until 2030. And, and so, uh, uh, you, you, what what do you see here? Well, there was a period uh, in the middle 1980s and the early 1990s when this went negative. So in a sense, in terms of my previous equation, uh, if that were to persist for decades, that this would lead to an explosive debt to GDP ratio. But it did not persist for decades. We could, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go into a lot of detail about what was going on there, except to say that interest rates were excessively high. In fact, they were excessively high coming into this period. And then inflation fell off, and, and the difference between the interest rate and the inflation uh, you know, rather exploded in the middle 1980s. Uh, and then that led to this unusual period, but it was an unusual period historically, that for the vast majority of the, of the history you see here, uh, the sustainability condition that the economic growth rate exceeds the after-tax interest rate actually has been, uh, has been satisfied. This number has been positive. Uh, it's a bit you know, lower now than it was in the, uh, in the 1960s, which will imply a somewhat higher debt ratio, but, uh, but not one that's explosive. Um, and uh, uh, so, so you see uh, that we are not in a situation where we're explosive. So let me just put this into the context of something like the, the COVID crisis. Um, so we're having this, you know, this great amount of borrowing. Well, what that's going to do is push the economy close. If, if we're eventually headed for a higher debt to GDP ratio, well, that'll speed the convergence in some sense. If, if we were more or less at our steady state, so to speak, or at our D star, um, 
then uh, the big borrowing for a crisis like this would push up the debt to GDP ratio, but only temporarily. And it would, it would kind of find its way back down to this, this uh, long run level. So as long as, as long as we stay in the positive range here and avoid uh, excessively high interest rates, especially, uh, then the, the, we're probably not in an explosive regime uh, for, for the debt to GDP. So big question number four, what about government deficits and interest rates? Won't high government deficits raise interest rates and hurt the economy? Well, uh, th this is actually probably the biggest concern uh, of mainstream uh, economics, that, uh, that somehow government borrowing will, will push up interest rates. Uh, and it, it's basically an Econ 101 story about supply and demand. So if you think about the interest rate being set by a, a big market for what's often called loanable funds, uh, that if you have more demand for funds, more demand for borrowing, you're going to push the demand curve upward and, and drive up interest rates, the interest rate being the price uh, of, the, of these loanable funds. So uh, higher government deficits would raise interest rates, according to this theory. And uh, the, the phrase that's often used is crowding out or, or crowd out private spending. Sorry about the, the typo on the, on the slide there. Uh, and in particular, there would be a concern about crowding out uh, private capital investment. And uh, again, I'm going to channel a little bit of our uh, late colleague Murray Wiedenbaum and, and say, yeah, you know, when Murray would talk about the deficit, I think this was his biggest concern, that it would push interest rates up and, and we would see less overall private spending, less borrowing for cars and houses, but in particular, less borrowing by businesses uh, for uh, machinery, for new structures, for things like this that might eventually lead to the growth rate or enhance the growth rate of the economy. Uh, so uh, the, the interest rate effect is, is maybe the biggest worry in mainstream economics about government deficits. Uh, but I have a little bit different perspective on this. Uh, oh my, let me just see here what happened. Oh, huh, I've got the slides. I was changing them last night and they're not changed. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll go with this. So the, I had actually changed this little thing to make it a little bit more graphic, but we'll just do it in words. So the, the, the big point here is that uh, government borrowing actually creates saving. So it's, a, it's an unusual supply and demand situation. Usually when you think about all oh, the demand for borrowing goes up, that's relative to some given supply of saving to finance that borrowing. Well, it's actually misleading. And here's where thinking about the system as a whole is so important because the government borrowing actually creates the supply of saving. So here, let me give you some uh, intuition for this for this idea, uh, a simple thought experiment. So suppose there's a, a Mary gets a tax cut of $100. So what's clear here is, and the government keeps its spending. So the government cuts Mary's taxes by 100 bucks, and then it borrows the $100 so it can maintain the same amount of spending. So the government's borrowing an additional $100. That, that's a given. Uh, now, what happens though with, when Mary gets her tax cut? Well, if Mary saves that extra $100, then she, her, her new saving has exactly offset the government borrowing. So there's an increase in government borrowing, but there's an increase in private saving and they exactly offset each other. So this is the idea, government borrowing <laughs> creates equivalent saving. But it's a little unrealistic to think that Mary will save her entire tax cut. In fact, Mary might spend part of her tax cut. So if Mary uh, saves just $50, but spends an additional $50 uh, at George's store, what happens? Well, Mary's new spending creates an additional $50 in income for George. He wasn't getting that money before, and, and now he's got $50 more of income. So Mary's saving at 50 bucks. George is getting $50 more of income, but what? maybe George will save all of his new income, and then, again, the total amount of, uh, of saving will, uh, will again be $100, new, new private saving. $50 from Mary, $50 from George, offsetting the government borrowing. Well, maybe George is spending some of his income, so we could keep going. If George spends income, he's going to create, uh, he's going to create uh, additional income for somebody else. They'll save part of it. They'll spend part of it. You know, this will work its way through the system. What I'm really describing here is what the economists call the multiplier process, but it's going to keep flowing through the system until eventually $100 of new saving is created. Uh, and, and so there's actually... The, the Econ 101 story is misleading. Uh, when the government borrows more uh, for to say that to, to do a tax cut, it's going there will be an equivalent amount of saving created. It's exactly the same thing 
if the government spends more, uh, because again, their spending is creating income, which some of which will be spent, some of which will be saved, and we go through the same kind of the same process. So the important result here is there really is no pressure on the interest rate because of government borrowing. The, the government demand for borrowing creates an equivalent amount of private saving uh, and not putting pressure on interest rates. Now, as I pointed out, this is probably the, the most obvious place in my talk where there is you know, some controversy about this. And there's the short run and long run debates and things along those lines. So let's, let's look at the evidence. Uh, what can we see? So here, what we see is that uh, uh, this is again a kind of a complicated chart. I apologize for that, but let me just talk, talk you through it. So I, I have two different uh, time series here. The red line is the deficit to GDP ratio, how much government borrowing is going on relative to the size of the economy. And the green line is, uh, is the real, it's inflation adjusted uh, yield on five-year treasuries. And I use the five-year uh, maturity quite, uh, quite on purpose. Usually you see more the, about the federal funds rate or the 10-year uh, the reason I chose five years is because that's roughly the, the average maturity of the government debt. The government's borrowing any place from three months up to 30 years, but uh, five years is about the average. So this should give us a rough sense of, of, uh, of the average interest rate on government debt. Okay, so, so what do we see? Uh, yeah, I've got a few things emphasized here. Um, yeah, actually this... Um, hmm. This is a much earlier version of, of the slides. I do apologize for that. So I'll have to be a little more careful uh, in describing what was going on. So um, uh, let's start here. This is actually the best, the best uh, historical period uh, to uh, support the more mainstream view that higher government deficits push up interest rates. So you see the basically the positive correlation. This, th these are the, in a sense, the, the Reagan administration deficits uh, that, that, that were rising during this period. And interest rates did go up, uh, especially adjust for inflation. So this actually was the you know, more mainstream view, less, less my view in, in this sense, uh, that they, they, they were moving together. Now I could talk about the history of this. I think a lot of this had to do with an unexpected drop in the inflation rate in the early 1980s after the deep 1981-82 uh, recession. Uh, so I, there's a question about causation, but on the surface, this uh, historical experience supports that idea that higher government deficits, the red line, lead to higher interest rates, the green line. But after that, the, the evidence kind of falls apart. So uh, this one I've emphasized here would be the, the so-called Clinton surplus years. So the deficit drops uh, dramatically. Uh, the deficit itself goes negative as we have a surplus. And what happens to interest rates? Well, actually, they slightly go up during this period rather than going down. Uh, there's certainly no evidence of the interest rate dropping dramatically. You see, the interest rate does start to drop pretty quickly here. But when is that? That's right as, we, as the tech bubble bursts and we move into the, uh, uh, the recession of 2000, 2001. So uh, during this period, they went the opposite direction. The deficit was falling. Interest rates were roughly stable to slightly higher. Uh, there was no uh, benefit to the interest rate of, of the falling government borrowing. And then since that, I've emphasized it with these two arrows, what's been going on. So there's a lot of volatility in the deficit. Uh, you know, in the, in the, after the tech bubble bursts, the deficit starts to go up a lot. This is the Great Recession. This is the COVID crisis. So it's ups and downs and ups and downs, but there's clearly this uh, longer term upward trend of the deficit. And there is very clearly a longer term a downward trend of interest rates. So the evidence is somewhat mixed, uh, at least on this simple way of looking at it. But for the past 22 years, it has gone in the direction of my uh, little argument here that uh, government borrowing creates equivalent saving and therefore does not really push up interest rates uh, uh, at all. And so why interest rates have fallen and things like that, it goes a little bit beyond the scope of my talk, but th there's just no evidence in the last quarter century that uh, government de high government deficits are associated with, uh, with higher interest rates. Okay, so we're moving through pretty well. I guess I don't wanna to take too much more time because I wanna leave some time for questions before we get to nine o'clock. Uh, but this one really comes back to the standard political meme here, which is, Will interest payments on government debt somehow impose an undesirable burden on our children and our grandchildren? So let's, let's look at this a little bit. And this is a theme I've used in my teaching for many years. Uh, so uh, this is the most common soundbite to criticize government borrowing. 
it is true that while debt, the debt doesn't really have to be repaid, it does need to be serviced. So the government does have to meet its interest obligations on its bills and bonds year by year by year. Uh, and the idea is, is, well, this could lead to possibly higher taxes in the future. If the debt ratio is rising, that we would have to raise taxes to pay this interest and that would, uh, that would put a burden on the future generations. Now, one thing to recognize uh, that I think is quite important is while the political common sense view says somehow we, the current profligate spenders, are borrowing from our children and our grandchildren, is it, it's, it's kind of misleading because when these interest payments come are, are paid, it's not like somehow our future children are paying us back. They're paying somebody else in their own generation. The interest payments create a, a basically a transfer, but it's a within generation transfer. So yes, in a sense, the taxpayers are paying interest, but somebody gets that interest. They're the bondholders and they're in the future. So the interest payments go to someone. It's not a net transfer between generations. A little quip here uh, on, on this one, which is if you're concerned about the future interest burden of government debt and, the, and, and what it will impose on, on your heirs, well, buy a government bond, put it in your estate. And so they will then become bondholders in the future. They, their taxes might be higher, but but they'll, they'll be getting that interest in the bond. So the idea of this intergenerational transfer is in some sense uh, fundamentally misleading. But here's the really the bigger issue, which is how big are these interest payments? Uh, you know, you could argue, yeah, it's true, this will go to bondholders, but they could be a foreign and, they, and, and we don't care about them so much. What we care about is, is the taxpayers and won't, the, and won't taxes have to be higher? But the question is, how, how big are these interest payments? Well, here again, I'm using the after-tax five-year treasury interest rates um, uh, adjusted for inflation. And this, this number has been below 1% since 2006. It's now actually negative. Uh, as, of, uh, you know, as we speak today, once you adjust for inflation, and certainly when you add the tax adjustment in, um, in, in a way, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the future taxpayers are benefiting from the government debt. Now, I don't want to push that too hard. I think that's a somewhat unusual situation. But the idea is that interest rates just aren't very high. Right now, the, I actually a little late last week when I first last looked at this, but the, the 30 year T bond rate is, is, uh, is under one and a half percent. And that's before inflation adjustment and before tax adjustment. 30 years, the government can borrow uh, for 1%. When you put inflation and taxes in there, you almost certainly get a negative number. Uh, so uh, you say, well, but interest rates might rise. That's true. But if interest rates rise, it's likely to, to happen when the economy is growing faster. And if you go back to my equation a few slides back, there's this idea that with faster growth, you would lower other things equal, lower the debt to GDP ratio, offsetting the effect uh, of the interest rate. Now, I've kind of looked at this a little bit and, um, and my rough forecast of a longer run debt to GDP ratio, we're looking out say 20 years out into the future, uh, will we'll be between 100 and, and uh, percent, 150 percent. Actually, I, like I said, I edited the slides. I've got an old version here. I actually pushed that up to 120 percent to 150 percent, but it doesn't much matter. And uh, it's very unlikely, in my view, that the real interest burden after taxes is likely to exceed one percent of GDP. Uh, so it, it is a non-trivial amount, but it is not such that by itself would, would be a reason to have a, a massive tax increase. And, and one, one point I wanted to make, again, I've been at this now for a while, and so, you know, there was this shift in the trend. We had the long downward trend in the debt to GDP ratio after World War II. And then in the early 1980s, it started to pick up again. Uh, the result being that, that the, the debt to GDP ratio rose quite significantly. And it's been doing so for about 40 years, but we've seen no tax increase uh, overall. In fact, let's look at the data on this one. So this is the federal tax share of GDP. I think it's very important here that you include social security and Medicare taxes. If you just used income taxes, my, my argument would be even stronger, but, uh, but I, I think that would be misleading. So, uh, you know, this has been a fairly stable number. There, there was a somewhat of an upward trend in the uh, 1950s and 1960s, but I benchmarked this in 1981, the beginning of those rising deficits uh, with the, the tax share at about 17.5%. And you can see that we did exceed this a bit, but it was in the, in the Clinton boom. And that's more because uh, the economy was so strong that income taxes were rising. And so uh, the tax share went up. Uh, but once, we went, once that slowed down in the, after the tech bubble burst, the tax share quickly came back to more, its more no, normal level. And then there's 
you know, here it's down during the Great Recession, then up again, and starting to fall again after the Trump tax cuts. But it's, you know, it, it's certainly not higher. So despite uh, what's now close to 40 years of rising government deficits, we've seen no increase in taxes. Um, so um, again, I don't think there, there doesn't seem to be a, a major concern here that uh, the, the debt to GDP path that we're on is going to somehow lead to um, lead to higher taxes. So you might be wondering at this point, well, uh, you're hearing one thing after the other about why government debt is never a concern. You say, well, I don't, you know, if that's really true, we should just borrow, you know, everything. Let's cut taxes to zero. Let's have every infrastructure bill we would like. Let's just go crazy, right? Uh, so the final big question is, can the government borrow too much? In spite of all these things I've talked about, which mitigate our concerns about government debt, is it possible for the government to borrow too much? And the answer is unequivocally, yes. The government can borrow too much. You should not take from anything I'm saying that the government can borrow an unlimited amount. Uh, and, and the key issue here is inflation. I promised to come back to the inflation idea uh, er, earlier on. Uh, when I've been talking about this in class over the years, I asked my students to consider a, a thought experiment. Consider the government borrowing $1 trillion versus $1 quadrillion. So a quadrillion is a thousand trillion. So a $1 trillion deficit and uh, borrowing, which and now we've actually had more like a $3 trillion uh, deficit in this unusual crisis, a uh, $1 trillion would be 5%, roughly 5% of GDP. Uh, I think in that situation, basically everything I, I said up till now holds. Uh, there's no upward pressure on interest rates. The future burden is, is minimal and, and maybe, maybe even zero. Uh, the economy can easily accommodate uh, a trillion dollars of extra spending, if that's what it comes to, either because the government's directly spending this or, or through tax cuts uh, that people spend more. Uh, there's, there's slack resources. We can bring more people in. We can raise productivity. You know, a, a trillion dollar expansion, especially in a weak economy, is, is easy, easy to accommodate. But a quadrillion dollars? Uh, then we would be talking about borrowing 50 times GDP and spending it. I mean, it would lead to hyperinflation. You know, we, you, you'd be putting millions of dollars in everybody's bank account and, and they would go crazy. Uh, they'd be spending, you know, and, and, and clearly the economy would not be able to keep up with that spending and so prices would rise and we'd have, a, we'd have an explosion of inflation. So there is a barrier and it's on the, ultimately on the, on the productivity of the economy. How much can the economy actually accommodate if we do have an expansion of government spending or we have tax cuts that lead the private sector to spend more you know, how much can, you know, can we handle? And, and so it's, a, it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, to, it requires estimates and, it, and, it, and, it, and, and there's gonna be some differences uh, about how big of a gap, how, how much we can expand. I will say this, that with the unemployment rate prior to the COVID crisis falling under 4%, that it seemed like the economy had more capacity to expand and accommodate greater amounts of spending and borrowing than uh, without inflation than many economists thought possible. Back when I started at Washington University in the early 1980s, the idea was, well, unemployment rate probably can't be much below six and a half, seven percent, and then that's been trending down over time. And, and we got to three and a half percent and we still saw no inflation. So there's uncertainty about where this barrier exists. It certainly exists someplace. You know, it, it requires you know, kind of careful analysis to, to figure this out. So uh, basically the, the, you know, the bottom line here, I'm off the topic of the slide a bit, is the government borrowing will always create money, income and saving, but we don't want expenditure to be so high that inflation will result. So the, the basic rule is don't do this. Now, and, and I would argue we haven't been doing it. We have not been pushing the inflation barrier. We've been below 2% for uh, 25 years. The Fed, if anything, is trying to get inflation higher. Uh, it recently changed its, um, its policy structure to say, well, we might even let fl inflation go uh, higher than 2% for a while because it's been below 2% for so long. So uh, high inflation seems not to be the least of our concerns right now, but it could be if we, if we overdid it with government borrowing. Okay, so uh, I'm uh, getting towards the end of, uh, of our time and I wanna leave some time for questions. So let me sum up with a few lessons. Common sense can be misleading about federal debt. The US is not on a path to financial ruin. Uh, government borrowing actually creates income and saving. Uh, so use it to, to target socially desirable goals. Full employment would be an obvious answer here. This is uh, an idea that's come to be known as functional finance. The idea here is that 
you set your government fiscal policy to create an objective to serve a function, uh, in this case, full employment, versus more of a conventional wisdom about sound finance to have government borrowing, say, to target a, a balanced budget or a particular debt to GDP ratio. So uh, this is a little different way of looking at, maybe a big different way of looking at uh, uh, what, what government borrowing and spending should do, but you must respect the inflation barrier. You don't want to overdo this. And so if you look at what's happened, for example, the, 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 the Trump tax cut. So uh, Democrats have criticized the assembly, and I think there's many reasons to criticize the Trump tax cut, but I would not criticize it because it raised the deficit. Uh, the amount, the increase there was certainly well within what the economy could accommodate without generating inflation, as we saw for a few years, even before the COVID crisis hit. Uh, so uh, this does change your view a bit on how to think about government borrowing. Um, you know, uh, austerity now to protect future generations is just not going to work. There is no big bill coming due. Uh, that The interest payments on future government debt is a transfer within future generations, not between generations. The, the big policy lesson there is to keep interest rates low uh, unless growth is skyrocketing and inflation is threatening. Uh, it's very unlikely that interest, uh, interest rates in a kind of normal economy, the way we've been functioning now for well over a quarter century, is gonna force a, a future tax increase. And I've already made the point about functional finance. The, the idea in some ways is use effective fiscal policy to make the economy grow faster. In which case the, the debt burden will be smaller and uh, I'm actually doing research along those lines that I'll report on at some future time. So um, there's a lot more to say, uh, but we're already uh, uh, getting close to our nine o'clock limit. And I do want to take a, 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 some questions. So, you know, you can, your question may be on this slide. Uh, foreign debt, uh, baby boom retirement. How do you target full employment? What about the distribution of taxes versus the overall level? I do want to emphasize one last point though, which is under no circumstances should you take this argument to say we should build bridges to nowhere. You know, the federal government should only do things that are worthwhile. Uh, you know, we could debate about whether we should have more green infrastructure or whether we should, you know, have uh, better roads or things along these lines or whether that's worth it or not and, you know, do a good cost benefit analysis of these things. Uh, there, this is no argument for government waste. It just says that the, you know, the more narrow sense that the uh, uh, conventional concerns about deficits and debt are probably overblown. So um, thank you. Uh, I welcome your questions, whether they be big or little.